This is Jay Tucker. Uh, I run the Center for Media Entertainment and Sports here at UCLA's Anderson School of Management. And I'm really excited about today's session, which is really the kickoff of a series of online conversations that we like to have to give people a better set of sense of what's happening in the business of sports. Today is baseball day, which is my favorite sport. Um, and I'm really excited because I've got one of my friends and fellow UCLA alum, Ariel Moyle, who's an agent actually and works in marketing for baseball for a company called Rep, Rep One. Um, and she has somehow convinced uh, baseball pitcher Alex Vessia to come join us as well. So we'll be able to talk today both about kind of the business and how that impacts players, the role of agents, um, and you'll be able to get some of that um, information from the perspective of a player himself and how that plays itself out. For those of you who are, are uh, not as passionate about the sport as I am, baseball is an American institution. Um, and while we spend a lot of time talking about uh, postseason in sports and uh, the major leagues, the journey into the industry starts long before that, right? There's amateur sports, high school, Olympics. We move into college. There are folks who choose and, and spend time in the minor leagues, um, which is professional baseball. Um, you know, and becomes the feeder to major league clubs. Uh, that's a long journey. When we think about how you take advantage of that experience, how you take advantage of that opportunity, there's a lot to it. So first I wanna bring in Ariel who can talk a little bit more about kind of the business of the sport, um, what the opportunities look like and how agents and agencies factor into that. Ariel, please take it away. Yep, so I'm going to do a screen share with everyone on a presentation I put together. It'll be easier to see with visuals. Can everyone see that? Yep. Okay, okay. okay. So I work for a company called Rep One Sports. Um, I had the um, marketing PR, digital marketing, and a number of other player services for the agency um, on the baseball side. So we represent MLB and NFL players. Previously, I worked for BDA Sports Management, which is a um, full-service basketball agency. So um, some of their more, more notable clients are Zach Levine, Steve Nash, uh, Luka Doncic, DeAndre Ayton, and a number of others. So um, big names there. Um, I bring up the two of them because this presentation will give examples from what I'm currently doing in baseball, but it's also going to show some examples about uh, what I have done in the past with basketball. So let's get started. Um, so the first question I'm going to answer is sort of this uh, sports business ecosystem and the variety of ways that athletes can make money in it. So it's my goal to, re to help a client realize their full potential on and off the field. Um, I really try and make sure that I get to know my players as individually as I can because we all know some of our favorite, at least some of my favorite campaign campaigns are really authentic and organic. Um, so there's really no limitation to what you can do to make athletes money. I, I like to say that I'm kind of notorious for thinking outside the box and breaking a few rules. So these are 10 categories where I have vast experience in making clients money, but I will let you know that there's, please don't limit yourself. If you do continue in a career like this, there's multiple ways in which you can, you can aid in a, a monetary value for a, a player. So first up, Biggest one we have is on-field contracts, right? So the biggest money taker is an employee-employer relationship. So a player will play baseball, they get play, paid by their employer to play baseball. Um, you have league um, associations, for us it's the MLBPA, and they act as a kind of a union. So uh, you'll see them set things like league minimums, or right now with the things that are happening with COVID-19, they're doing direction-based items uh, about salaries related to COVID-19. So there is a kind of a third player with athletes with these players associations, but it is really an employer-employee relationship at the end of the day. Um, my best and one of my favorite examples of this is uh, we signed a record breaking contract for our client Ronald Acuna Jr. who became the youngest player ever in age and professional status to um, receive a hundred million dollar contract. Second example is equipment. Um, equipment uh, can be really lucrative. Um, in baseball, it, it doesn't pay as much as it did in basketball, and there's a number of reasons for that, mainly because basketball gear is a lot of uh, street culture gear and you can wear it offside the court. So the return on your athlete wearing those items is a lot higher than something like baseball where you're not gonna walk around with a glove on or cleats. But um, I do. 
Do you do? Well, yes. that's a thing. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, equipment deals, do you pay a lot um, on guarantees or they pay a lot on incentives? So there's four categories of equipment deals that I do. Uh, the first one is product only. Um, that matters. So uh, for someone like Alex who might be coming up um, soon into the MLB, they have to re they have to um, uh, bring a number of their equipment pieces. If I can get them product only deals, that sh that saves them from having to spend money to buy their own equipment. Um, some agencies in some categories like us, we do actually uh, purchase and provide equipment for athletes. So it ultimately saves the business having to buy those items. Um, the other level is an endorsement level, and in there you've got multiple categories. So an endorsement level means that some sort of money will be exchanged. So it's either a signing bonus, um, your deal's either incentive-based, which means you get no guaranteed money, but based on how you perform, you might get money paid later. Um, a guaranteed compensation, which I mentioned, so Luis Severino right here is a great example of someone who has a guaranteed compensation, or you can have a combination of those. So for Luis, he's an Adidas athlete, he gets a certain amount of money from Adidas every year to wear um, uh, their gear. I took this picture of him at the press conference. I like this because it's a great example of he of him and how he's aware of how he has to wear the brand. So in something like a media interview at the end of a game, he's got his Adidas shirt on and he's doing his brand well. Um, he also has incentives in his contract. So depending on if he wins a Cy Young award or something other something other um, performance based during the season, he could get incentivary money at the end of that season as well as the guaranteed compensation. My next biggest category is memorabilia and signatures. So um, especially in baseball, um, you know, baseball uh, has an old school mentality in a lot of ways still. Um, for those that don't know, the medium demographic for viewership in baseball is still 54 year old males, um, usually of Caucasian descent. So. If we talk about something like the NBA where the demographics skew much younger, um, there's differences in kind of how memorabilia and signatures work there. But for baseball, people still love to trade cards. They like to get gear. So um, my example here is our client, Raphael Devers. So he has an, uh, um, an exclusive agreement with Fanatics Authentics, which means that they are the only people allowed to sign or oh, sorry, allowed to sell signed gear by Raphael. So anything that is, uh, you know, balls, cards, bats, um, gloves, anything, um, Fanatics is that purveyor. And a number of our clients have card deals with brands like Panini, Tops, Upper Deck, you know, member deals with uh, memorabilia deals with Fanatics, um, and. Um, <clears throat> I also say that, um, sorry, I'm getting a notification on Zoom. I'm gonna just leave alone. Um, uh, there's also a lot of, there's small memorabilia dealers that that are local, locally based in certain cities. So you'll do, I'll do a lot of deals with those local dealers too. So memorabilia tends to be the third most lucrative category for athletes. Um, the fourth one is marketing. Um, I love this example of a campaign I did with DeAndre Ayton for a number of reasons. He was a former client of mine at um, BDA Sports. So generally everything else that I do is considered marketing. I'll break down other categories like digital marketing and public relations, but they still fall under the general umbrella of marketing. Um, Really, it's it's any other way you can make them money. Um, and so I pulled this example because when DeAndre got drafted uh, as the first round draft pick in the 2018 draft, we got approached by a company called Rock and Protein to have him be uh, a spokesperson for their brand. Um, so he was he had to do a video shoot, he had to do a photo shoot. Um, you know, I had to do approvals and all those items. I had to redline the contract. Like, there's a lot of things that go into something this large. Um, it's really months and months of work to to come up with just photographs at the end of the day, like this. Um, this is considered a strict marketing campaign because not only were they using him on digital, but they also used him in advertising um, out of home. So uh, that's a term that we use for uh, like um, things that you see outside of your house. So like if you go to the grocery store and you see someone up on a package, that's considered out of home. Um, I like this example too because it kind of uh, shows how the player branding system is a 360 degree job and how I have to be on all the time. So my first extra credit question there was, if you notice in everything that he's wearing, it's Puma gear. So his equipment deal is with Puma. 
to even do an outside branding campaign, he has to wear Puma gear. So we had to work to get gear ordered from Puma that the company Rock and Protein liked and then send it to the brand to have them screen print it so that he was not violating any, any other terms of his deals um, within this Rock and Protein campaign. The other example is that they did a Spotify playlist as part of this campaign, and one of the things they wanted him to do was to wear a pair of headphones. Well, DeAndre also had a deal with a headphone brand called Music, in which case we then had to get headphones from Music to make sure that they were available for this production shoot. So even though this rock and protein campaign was for one brand, it's, it, it, it required us to be very cognizant of all the other aspects to what DeAndre is bound to on other contracts and make sure that he was complicit um, within this rock and protein campaign. This is just an example of our marketing partners that we currently work with. I like this diagram because it shows a mix of, of how equipment plays in here, how trading cards play in here, how luxury brand, brands play in here, how car dealerships play in here, how you know league sponsors like Pepsi play in here. So um, you know just kind of an overall view of all of you know some of the brands we work with and we work with a lot more than this. Um, the next category that falls under marketing is digital marketing. So um, digital marketing is anything that just lives on digital platforms. So yes, it falls under the marketing category, but it's a specifically its own category because nothing leaves the digital space. So this example that I have here is a campaign that Zach Levine did with Hawthorne and Company for a um, you know perfume and cologne line. Um, all, the only place it was sold was on their website. The only advertisements were um, through Instagram and other digital pages. There was nothing out of home. There was nothing in print. There was nothing on TV. This was strictly digital. So, um, you know, more co common forms of this. I'm sure you've seen these. Is you know, are people posting, you know, pictures of. Um, you know, uh, a mattress or a video game online and it's tagged like EA partner for, you know, a FIFA thing or, or whatnot. Um, those are digital campaigns also and consider digital marketing because it just lives on the digital platform. Public relations. So, you know, media companies, they also need content and they might pay an athlete for that content. So this could be an interview, it could be an exclusive story, it could be digital media for their feeds. Um, there's also a really interesting category of public relations that people I don't think are aware about. It's called branded content. So um, say someone comes to me and uh, they know I have an Adidas athlete and this Adidas athlete has really great um, you know exposure and they, they tend to skew really well when you come when it comes to metrics on their 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 media bites that company like adidas might be like well our golf numbers are really low we're trying to advertise this new golf product it's not really working out but we know that this basketball player loves golf and does really well with golf they might pay somebody like bleacher report to do a interview for this client knowing that two of the questions are going to be about, hey, what do you do on your extra time? And that player knows that that player has to answer, I like to golf. And then Bleacher Report might follow it up with, uh, great, what are some products that you use? And that player knows they have to reply with such and such products. So it's called branded content through public relations. But for the consumer, it doesn't feel like branded content, but that player is effectively getting paid on the back end for having those sound bites for that brand. Um, this example I had was Kelly Oubre. Uh, Complex has a number of original shows that they have to fill with airtime. And so Kelly did this one for Kicking It with Kickstradamus. Again, part interview, part digital series. So, you know, I think also in the age of, um, of technology growing, you'll see a lot more of these public relation pieces kind of bleed the lines of digital marketing and they sort of work together. Um, these are smaller categories that I, I sort of label other marketing that they apply. So affiliate programs, I'm sure you guys have seen this. If someone posts a workout video and goes, hey, if you click my, you know, this link to sign up, uh, you'll get a 20% discount. Or please use my code when you buy this product and you'll get 15% off. Those things are all affiliate programs um, and the, the person posting will also make money. Um, Fortnite is an actually really great example of this. They, they do not pay at all for advertising because the game is so popular. But what they do do is with certain partners and athletes, they actually give affiliate codes to those people so if you have a Twitch stream and you do Fortnite and you tell people to sign up to Fortnite using your code, that athlete then gets money on the back end. Another big category that, um, you, that I see often usually during season are one-offs. So anytime someone wants to pay an athlete for 
a one-time use of their time. So um, uh, a school, uh, a high school wants a player to come by and talk about their journey to get to the NFL or the NBA or whatever. They're going to pay him a $10,000 speaking fee to show up for two hours. And that, that athlete is then used, you know, that's his fee for his time for that amount of time to show up at that school and do that speaking fee. Um, I've had requests for athletes to go to people, their people's kids' birthdays and bar and bought mitzvahs. Like there's pe people who have the money will pay for athletes to kind of do anything. And so one-offs is one of those categories. Um, one of the bigger categories that I work in is in-kind trade. So in-kind trade implies a trade of goods. So it's a like good for another good. I think my better, the better way to talk about this is this example on the, um, the um, right that I have of uh, Dee Gordon. Um, so Dee Gordon is a client of mine now. Uh, during COVID-19, Buca de Beppa was looking to advertise that they have family meal deals and that you can order online and they can still deliver. So they approached us about Dee Gordon doing a Instagram story in exchange for meals for him and his family. So they got, he got to pick 10 big family size items on the menu, whatever he wanted. It got delivered to his house. And then um, he had to do that following post where we agreed on the language ahead of time and he made sure that he tagged Buka, Buka, Buka de Beppo. But that is an example of in-kind trade. There's no money being traded, but there are goods of some kind being traded. Um, and the last one is a large item trade. This is technically part of in-kind, but because of the value of what's being traded, the con a contract usually takes place. So. I don't, you don't see this too often, and the, the times that you really do see it are car leases. So um, Ronald Acuna has an Audi deal right now. In that Audi deal, they're giving him a car valued at you know over sixty plus thousand dollars a year. In exchange, he has to give them such and such and such um, a, a things. Um, and by the way, when I'm talking about all this, uh, just in the back of your head, like, um, how do I put this? No deal that I ever do will ever get to a client until it's fully vetted. So that, uh, that an Audi deal I just mentioned for Acuna, those deal points on what we agree that he's going to do in return, that's probably taking a good amount of my time to go back and forth with the company to find what we both mutually agree on. And once we have a mutual agreement on the length of the term, what exclusivity is in that category, what the company is asking of my client, and what um, my client has to do in return, then once those items are figured out, then I present it to a client. And the client ultimately has the right to accept or reject it at that point. But I would say only about 15% of the work I do ever actually gets in front of a client. The other 85% is me constantly pitching and working and trying to get deals, but they either don't come to fruition, don't get responses or whatnot. But I want you guys to understand that like it doesn't, it's not as simple as like, hey, give me a car lease. Hey, great, here's a couple signed items. There's a lot that kind of goes into that. Okay. Last item that I have is um, they're kind of like miscellaneous categories. So uh, donations. I would love if every single person that I work with gives back because they are doing it out of the goodness of their heart, but oftentimes we recommend donations because it's strategic. If you do a certain donation level, it helps you on your taxes, it can help you with PR, or there's a lot of other reasons why we might do donations. So I put that in here because it feels like you're spending money, but at the end of the year, it can actually help you a lot save money on your taxes. Um, investments too. So we can help with investments. So I am not a financial planner and we, uh, Rep One does not have financial solutions under its portfolio. Some other agencies might, but we do have people that we work with. Um, so a great example of this is our current client, Jose Reyes. He created a music label while he was playing in the MLB. So he took some of the money he was making on his contract has a really big passion for music, and he decided to open EL7, uh, has done really well for himself, retired last year, is now focused entirely on music and some other extracurricular activity or items. Um, and he has songs uh, by either himself or other uh, artists on his label that are currently being played on Spanish radio and in nightclubs in the US and the Dominican Republic. Um, my last category is kind of this extracurricular, right? So you see people do coaching and broadcasting. And again, like this is usually reserved for people who are retired. Um, my other great example here is a uh, former client, Steve Nash, who is an advisor for the Warriors. So he's not a full-time staff member. He advises the team, he advises the, the players, but he gets paid for that. So he's able to use his success on the, uh, uh, the court and, um, and kind of transition that to a career outside of when he was done playing. 
playing uh, basketball. So we're gonna go really, or Jay, sorry, I think you need to prompt me here, apologize. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's kind of the 360 approach for player branding. Um, and again, I, I always say that there's no limitation to kind of what you can do. So think outside the box. Um, you know, I think that athlete value has increased over time. It's less about, it, it, there's obviously the component of how well you play your sport, but there's also this component of branding outside the sport that's really hitting mainstream culture, where back in the day, usually the only people in advertisements were like, you know, Michael Jordan, Mia Hamm, and, and the anything you can do, I can do better commercial for Gatorade because they were, you know, the top of their sport. So branding right now is really, really important for athletes because you can make a lot of money just based on your personality and extracurriculars versus uh, only having to rely on your play style on the field. So uh, quick question from for you, Arielle, and then I want to bring Alex into the conversation. Yeah. Um, when you talk about what a player should expect in general over the course of their career, and you kind of break uh, out like what value they can potentially capture for themselves in buckets, how much, you know, or what percent roughly is the, I'm on the field, my contract is worth this percent of the bucket, and then off the field, the other things that you just ran through is worth this other percent of the bucket, give or take. Is it 50-50? Is it 90-10, 99-1? Like, ballpark, what's the kind of the balance in terms of how people should think about those extracurricular activities? Okay, unfortunately, it's not going to be the same ratio per sport. I'll give you a great example. I talked earlier about how lucrative NBA contracts are for equipment deals. Right. You could make $100 million on the court for a five-year deal with your team. You can also make $100 million on an equipment deal. So, you could make roughly the exact same amount of money you would make on the court. In baseball, there's no way that's gonna happen. For me, oh, for me, like a top, top of the line deal for a player in baseball is like a hundred grand. And the reason being is that there's a big exposure difference. Again, it's that inability to wear baseball gear off of the field. So it's going to vary by sport. Um, and it's also gonna vary by market. A client who plays for the Yankees or the Dodgers, who are the two most um, recognizable. Uh, yeah, recognizable baseball franchises in the country, will make more money than somebody who's in Cincinnati or Baltimore. I mean, it's just the way it is. So if you're in one of those smaller markets, that on-field performance really comes into play. It, it, you have to kind of be at the top of your roster. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't think I can give you a ratio because I really do think it varies by person. And I also, you know, for baseball too, right, we've got pros and then we have a multiple levels in the minors. So yes. if you're a minor league player, you're most likely not going to make any endorsement money at all until you become a, a top 30 prospect for your organization or until you make it in the majors. So I can do things like company-wide giftings, or like I told you, in-kind trade is a really, really, really great way for me to make uh, players happy who can't make money yet. Mm -hmm. But it's it would be it's nearly impossible for me to make money for people that are in the minors, unless you're in that top 30 organization. I don't know anything about being an agent other than what I saw in Jerry Maguire, mm -hmm. but it seems as though there are a lot of ways that an agent can potentially help an athlete. And right. I'd love to hear more about your journey right? Like, you know, kind of what's happened to you over this time and the places where maybe you felt like agents really helped you, um, not necessarily in terms of financially, but just in terms of your journey and what your goals are, what have agents been able um, to do that's made an impact for you? Um, I, can, I, can I was going to say really quickly before Alex talks, I think I'm going to keep this diagram up because I did a breakdown of kind of what our agency looks like. And so when Alex speaks, it'll be able to let you see the correlation between each division. Um, and so, sorry, Alex, I know I'm cutting you off. I just want to do this really fast. So in Rep 1 Sports, there's three big groups, right? We've got corporate initiatives, football, and then baseball. Um, I made the note there that football essentially has a repeat amount of staff and services, so you can imagine that that's there. For us, we have agents. So to be an agent, you have to, by definition, to be an agency, sorry, you have to, by definition, have agents, right? Agent, agency. The other arm in which I uh, reside, player services, is an extra. If you are a smaller agency, you might not have this internally, and you might go to different companies to, re to, to sort of contract these items out. So... 
Um, for agents, that person's going to help Alex all the way from advising in high school all the way through the end of his career in a multitude of different ways. Um, and there's a list there. On player services, that's everything from marketing, PR, digital marketing, equipment, um, client management. Um, and, and I like to put mom, dad, brother, sister, therapist there because that really winds up being what happens. Like we tend to be the people that that our clients come to with, with things that they're sensitive about. Um, and I want to make one thing really clear just on the client management side of this. Our client managers are not personal assistants. So they're not picking up laundry. They're not taking someone's dog for a walk. They're there to be the facilitator between MLB teams and the agency for those uh, group related servicing items um, to relay that to the client. So if I do a marketing deal, I'm going to go to Ronald Acuna's client manager to then bring it to Ronald and discuss it with him. Um, so, you know, but I, I feel like, I feel like personal assistant gets thrown out and I want to, I want to make sure that that, that is uh, um, understood as a misconception. Um, lastly, just for a quick example on a corporate initiative, we do a number of things that are corporate based. So not only do I help on baseball, I actually oversee partnerships and sponsorships on the corporate level. So we do a three day, event every year where we invite all of our athletes to do programming and train and it's super fun it's called the rep one um, athlete summit so all of the programming all of the event production all of the logistics and all of the sponsorships that's me so the what we did in january spotify coming you know like vineyards showing up like all of those reach outs were between myself and the other chief of staff to kind of grab those relationships so that's an example of a corporate relationship uh, or sorry, in a corporate initiative, um, you know, it's something that we do so all of our athletes can come together at, at a particular moment. Um, and, at, and right now I'll give the floor to Alex. I just wanted to make sure that I, I gave that breakdown so what he talks about makes sense because he's going to kind of go through his process uh, before the draft, his process with the agency after the draft, his overall relationship with his agent, Mike, and then we'll, he'll talk about kind of how his relationship with the player services arm works. So Alex, take it away. Very cool. Um, so yeah, my the my process of how all this kind of started um, in 2018, I had got drafted. Um, I did not have an agent. I basically, you know, it was either I was going to sign with an MLB team to play in the minor leagues and work my way up, or I was going to go uh, and work a, a nine to five job, you know, doing, doing something else. So that was, you know, my, my goal was to get drafted and everything like that. Um, so I ended up playing rookie ball, uh, and then getting promoted to just short season, a ball. And through that time, um, uh, playing, I didn't really know what I was doing. Right. I was, you know, ordering off of different sites for cleats and gloves and everything because the organizations don't, provide that for you. You have to provide that for yourself. Um, so it was kind of, you know, it was just a different field than what I thought it was. I thought that I could do it by myself. Um, and I, after that first full year, I, or I, you know, I told my parents, I was like, I think we should uh, start to look and see. A so I had talked with uh, three or yeah, two or three different agents before I had talked with Mike. And the two or three agents uh, before were lawyers. Um, and when I had talked to them, it, there, wasn't, there wasn't a very friendly vibe. They were basically telling me how much I was going to, or how much they were going to take uh, from my MB uh, contract. And that was pretty much about it. It was kind of alarming to me because it seemed like they didn't really, you know, they didn't, there was no protection whatsoever. Um, you know, it's, it made me steer away from them very quick. So I had, I'd met, um, we sat down at, at like, like a brunch with I, and he, he laid it all out on what rep one offers. And it's going back to what that chart, um, had stated all those different, uh, resources that rep one, uh, has to offer. And, you know, for myself and, and even my parents, we walked from that conversation and we immediately were like, Mike is the one he's, you, you know, he, he, uh, has many years 
of experience in baseball. So that's where, you know, he's kind of like a coach to me, a, somewhat of a mentor in a way where, you know, in baseball, it's a lot of failure. You know, there, there's not, you know, there's little success, but a lot more failure, right? So being able to have someone and, um, you know, being able to call him and, and talk about different situations and uh, baseball related kind of issues or, or anything. If I'm feeling like my mechanics are off or, or mentally and stuff, I can go to Mike and, and he'll be able to tell me because he has that experience. He, you know, I, I feel like the other law, uh, lawyers slash agents that I had talked to, they wouldn't have been able to tell me because I don't think they, or they didn't have that experience. So, um, you know, Mike, he's, super straightforward. He definitely, he told me, he's like, the minor leagues is a grind and, and, you know, it, you're going to have to put a lot of work in and, and everything. So that was kind of how I was raised. There, there was never a point where, you know, my parents were like, you know, you're going to make it. It was always like, you're going to have to work very hard and earn everything that, you know, that you, um, for it. So, um, it was, you know, a very big, um, step for us self and my family because once the 2019 season uh had started to get underway um i was able to get like equipment and, and other uh things i you know talked to it and he would get it all taken care of so you know in the bigger picture it let me focus on the field what I needed to do day in and day out and not have other distractions um, like getting cleats, ordering them, making sure that they've shipped um, and they're at their, and they're coming into this specific location, you know, all that stuff, you know, it can get quite stressful because I go, you know, you go through a, quite a bit of cleats or even getting a glove. Uh, gloves are super, super, super expensive. And you, you know, you want to make sure that, you have the, the right equipment so you can perform to your highest abilities out on the field. Um, so that was, I really got a, a good um, kind of glimpse of that as the 2019 season started to, to get underway. Uh, then getting moved up uh, from low A to high A and then high A to double A. Um, you know, Mike was, was right in, right in my corner season? the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, Alex has one of the fastest rises in an MLB season of like any player. He went from a short season to double A, and 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 then he went to made the Arizona Fall League, and then went to Major League camp like within a year. It's actually pretty. So, cool. so yeah, so with that being, um, I had no idea the Arizona Fall League was all about right. So when I had heard guys talking about it, dugout, um, they had kind of told me they're like. Um, what is that? Right. And they, and their definitions of it were I called Mike and I was like, what's this Arizona fall league thing all about? And, and that about the top prospects, um, you know, be playing in front of, you know, not to people, but it's the love of baseball before you get to the MLB and it's a good test me, um, see where I'm at. So that was like, it's, it's nice to have that information, you know, and that's where rep one and then also Mike, they come into play. Um, so it's, it's definitely, it's nice to have them in my corner. You know, I, I, I trust them with, with everything that I got and I know that they have my back. So, and that's where um, after the fall league and stuff, um, I'd sat, I had talked with Mike and he was telling me about potentially getting invited to, to big league camp and what that has to entail, um, you know, and what we had talked about. And then also my experiences in big league camp were spot on. You know, I felt like I was prepared to, to, per, to perform and I knew mentally that I was ready. And, you know, it's, there, there's a lot of behind the scenes that like Mike does for me that helps my days go, go by smooth. So, um, and that's also what Ariel does in her side, you know, there was, um, the big thing about building my brand. Uh, she helps me with that all the time. I remember the first time I had asked her about Instagram, um, and Twitter, how, you know, how to make myself professional and, and you know, and she was, you're going to have to change your name. And I was like, wait, 
what? And she's like, you know, not your name, just the, the handle. Oh, the Twitter we handle. Okay. Yeah. Look. It was something yeah, about it. was like, no one's going to find you unless it's Alex Vesia. Like, you need to change yeah, your and, handle. And that's Alex where Vesia. I had, because I think it was like, I think it was like A underscore. Yeah. There was like a couple different um, numbers in there. I would never have thought about, you know. You know, she slowly but really like set me up to, to you know, have, have, have the Instagram where people can find my, they, they know where to look and stuff. So it's not a Google search that's super, super hard to find. So um, she has sent me multiple emails about 10 tips about making your, your Instagram, you know, uh, what's up, more, more likes and more yeah. views and, and, and diff how you comment, interact with people, um, you know, that I, I have no idea about. So yeah, it's, it's definitely um, that, that side of things is really cool. And then as I've moved up and, and made a, a, I would say a bigger name for myself, I'm on the prospect list now and stuff that, um, you know, equipment deals and these different deals that Ariel was just talking about, you know, it's not only saves me a whole bunch of money, but it saves rep one a whole bunch of money as well that we can get my, I got, I have a Wilson deal. So for gloves, um, instead of spending $400 or $500 on gloves a year, you know, I, they, they provide me, you know, I'm signed with them. So, um, that's, I'm very, very thankful about that. And what also about really knowing like she's taking care of that behind the scenes. There, there was one day, um, Zarelli called me and he was like, we got you a Wilson deal. And I was like, no way. Like I had a, that, you know, those are things that I dream about, you know? Um, so that's where it takes all bring and, and you know, cause there's no way I would be able to try to get a deal for myself and then also play baseball at the same time and dealing with different people and emails and stuff. That's just from my, you know, player. I, I throw the ball as hard as I can and get guys right. out. Like, right. that's what I want to do. Yeah. Right. Your job is to make and execute a quality pitch at every opportunity. It's not to get yeah. deals with Wilson, to show no. up with bat mitzvahs, to whatever. That's right. not your job. I understand. I understand. Yeah. And, oh. you got, and you got good people in your corner. I, heck, I need now. Right. It sounds like I need to get Ariel to give me Twitter advice. I've got all of, like, 13 right. followers. Uh, yeah, I know. So, you know, it's definitely um, – there's, there's a, there's other agencies out there that I, I, I'm guaranteed they do a good job. Right. But with rep one and how Ariel and, and Mike work with me, you know, it's top notch, you know, and it, and they do everything the right way. And it, it builds confidence with myself knowing that I have people behind me that when I make it to the big leagues and, and I'm, you know, put in situations where, Hey, I'm going to be dealing with contracts and, and different, you know, uh, outside deals that I'm, I'm going to be able to go to them, call them. Hey, I, I, I need your advice, you know, or, or shoot, they're, they're probably going to be calling me and saying, look, this is what we've got because they're on top of it, you know, way more than I, than I will be. So. Yeah. I'll give, you, I'll give you a cool example of that. So Alex didn't know that since he made major league camp, I was trying to get him his first card and signature deal for months. So the first time he made major league camp, I had what, February is when I pinged, um, you know, both Panini and Tops about that. And uh, as of yesterday, I got the offer for Alex to get his first card deal. So he got that yesterday and accepted it. So it sometimes takes months of work. But if I can keep bugging them, I mean, the amount of emails I sent, I was like, hey, look, he just posted another uh, zero hit game, like six, six wins in a row, blah, blah, blah. Like I was sending it to, you know, them over and over. And then finally, like, they go, okay, okay, we'll give you what you want. And they, like, gave me a prospect deal for him. So, I mean, it, it definitely... Um, is that kind of thing where like I'm always supposed to be working on behalf of everyone whether or not Alex or anybody else knows like I am there doing that work behind the, behind like that deal they finally get yeah so that and that and that's a, Mike called me the other day yeah yesterday and was like hey we got you a tops deal and I was like no you didn't like don't play with me like that right because I had no idea we hadn't even talked about it but that, that's right. like you know that's how it works in, in, in a really, really cool way. Cause you know, they're always working as, as I am. So 
yeah, it's it's nice. It's super cool. It's uh we got we got a really good thing going. That's for sure. No, I love that, and it's so funny because I think about the, you know, there are stories about some quirky ex players who had very specific requests about their baseball card photos and stuff like that. But it really is a rite of passage, you know, when you think about okay, I now I know I made it because I'm on a card or I'm in the video game or whatever, and. Um, I can imagine having people out in your corner trying to make sure that those things happen for you, especially here in the front side of your career, makes a big difference. And, and you know, yeah. it sounds like from what you're saying that the work ethic is that you guys have a similar work ethic, that, that these guys are working yeah. as hard for you as you're working to try to make it to the big leagues and, and make a big splash. So I love that. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And that's right. like the, unlike just one more note, it's like we, we talked about it uh, yesterday where you, uh, window can be very short it can be you know one year it could be five years in Derek Jeter's behalf it's 20 plus you know mm -hmm. so you know that I would like to make the most the opportunity that I've that I'm have been given right whether that is one year you know four six years whatever that, that rep one Ariel and and Mike, you know, we're, we're do the best to make sure that when my time is done, that, you know, I, I won't be looking for another job, you know, we'll, we'll be able to establish, um, you know, things that will set me up for later down the road. So that's like, that's also another very, very um, big quality that I like uh, about Rep One and, and what they have, you know. Sure. And my hope is, you know, it's funny because I have a similar goal for all athletes. And one of the things that we do at the center is that we are trying, we've already launched a few courses specifically for athletes on the business of, of sports and entertainment, specifically so that folks know what their options are after they're retired. And one of the things yeah. that Arielle pointed out earlier in her presentation was that she works with um, former, you know, uh, active players too, not just the active players. And I think that's a big part of it, man, having a, having a relationship that lasts more than that kind of player's window. Now, I mean, obviously there are averages and baseball's average is pretty long, but there are wide deviations from the average. People, you know, a season and a half and they're out. And yeah, as you said, Derek Jeter can be two, two decades, right? NFL is really short. I mean, people, uh, Brady is an outlier. I mean, people don't play that long. So. No, no. So, so yeah. that's amazing. Now, um, you know, there are a lot of other things that we could talk about here. And one of the things I wanted to ask was about advice to students. But instead, what I'm going to do first is quickly look and see if we have any questions in the chat space. Again, I'm going to remind everybody that you, you can ask questions of any of us um, simply by clicking on the chat button and typing a question. And we'll go ahead and, and read those questions and try to respond to them as best as we can. Do you want um, me to quickly talk about kind of just like 30 seconds on like COVID-19 and how that's affected baseball and marketing right now? No, let's hold uh, off on that. Let's hold uh, off on that. Um, right. You know, uh, first question from Ryan Field is to Alex. It's, you know, the question is basically that the agent player relationship is a professional one but how much does the personal side of it play into your decision? So, I mean, be, being able to, I, yeah. Okay. So I understand that it's a, it is a very professional relationship. Um, but the, the personal side to things, I mean, when Mike calls me and so what's up, man, how we doing? You, that's just, like, it's, I, it's, easy it's natural that there's nothing forced i don't want to be scared to call my agent uh to ask for something you know that that's not that's that's not how it should work you know and and with mike we you know in the beginning yeah he very very professional and and that's you know how it should be because he's representing a very big company so um but as we get to know each other and understand how we work, you know, Mike knows that like seven days out of seven that I'm in the gym, I'm working out, I'm doing my thing that like, he doesn't have to call me and be like, Hey, did you do this today? He, it's not, it's not a babysitting job. Um, so being personal, yeah, we're pretty, you know, 
were pretty friendly. Like, you know, I, I, I remember him, um, something he's like, you know, I'd like for us to get personal to where like, you know, one day, like I'd be in your, like I'd be at your wedding, you know, to where that's like how comfortable we are, you know, it, it and then you told him marriage are you crazy no yeah it's it's like (laughs) there's um the the professional side always there uh but then on the personal side yeah that does very a big decision you know you got to be able to communicate very well um and make sure that you're not just um like how do i put it that you're not like putting in false expectations, you know, I've, I've heard, um, from others that, you know, agents that they, they kind of stretch it a little bit, you know, and I don't, I don't want that. I want, I want the cold hard truth because that's kind of always how I've grown up. There's, there's never been any, um, big either lies or or stretching the truth in that way. So. And that's why on my agency diagram, I put on the agency side that the last bullet point was on what they do was, the shit, AKA everything and anything, because it's so true. Like, uh, you know, I've known agents that have, you know, their player has been demoted or something's happened. It's literally held them while that person cried. Like, and that's the same for the player services side. Like I act as the mom or big sister to a lot of my players. Like I've got two of the biggest names in baseball who are Dominican. And the, the three of us have like a standing Friday evening FaceTime call on WhatsApp right now where we just hang out because they're so stir crazy right now that we've made like this little like thing to look forward to every week. And it's really important for them because we can talk about work, but I can also be like, Hey, what movie are you guys watching or whatever else? And if you, and actually those little tidbits too secretly for me help. Like if I find out, Oh, you really like comedies or something else, like just from happenstance conversation, I have a, I have a database where I kind of jot those notes down, but you know, Alex and I can be in impersonal, but he also respects me that when I need to get serious with him, he's going to listen to me. So it's like, you need to make sure that you, you walk that line and it's a fine line, but if you walk it well, you can really be a guiding force professionally and personally for athletes. And I think in a world where guys are, you know, a lot of people want to get in front of you because you're an athlete and the, the fandom thing of it to know people are in your corner that you trust is extremely important, even if that's on a personal level. I love it. I was about to ask you that very question because Alex kind of emphasized communication when he was talking about the relationship. And I can't really visualize the challenges of, you know, wanting to be a good steward of those players and their careers, mm-hmm. but also wanting to build a healthy relationship. And how, what does that mean, you know, in terms of communication? Does, does, do you have to like kind of uh, plan to have conversations with folks? Do you just try to um, deal with things in the moment? How do you make sure that players are focused on the things that you know are gonna be important for them? Um, you know, when I, when I first came to rep one, I'll get personal on this one. I think that a few people were really taken aback as to why I showed up because I came from basketball the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I think that it took them a second to understand that I could do the job. I think a few of them thought like this girl has no idea what they're, what she's getting into with baseball. I find that I have an uncanny ability to get along with athletes. And if you give me the the time, it's going to happen. So the first few months were a little hard um, because I had to prove myself when you're starting from scratch like that, or you're starting in this business as a student and you're trying to find a job, like, especially with all of my athletes, if they can't trust me, I can't do my job at all. I mean, that's ultimately it. And so like, I have to get that trust first and foremost. And from then you have to understand I'm doing the best job possible that I can for you. And if you don't think that's true, can we have a conversation and do I have the materials to show you that I am? So I would like to pretend that Alex always knows everything that I'm doing, that I'm doing the best job. Maybe there's one day that he doubts me. I told him yesterday, I have something that I update every day and I put in that document every single day what I do on behalf of each and every athlete I have worked on that day. So if a year from now you go, what did you do for me in 2020? I'll be like, funny you asked. And I can pull it up and I can show you per month the amount of work I did did on you. And I do that because 
I told you like 15% of the work I do actually comes to fruition. Like I have to prove that I'm also doing other things with my time. So if we can be honest with each other, and I believe that even if I'm not going to give you the answer you want, I will always be honest, then I think that's the best basis for a relationship. And I think that's when players really do kind of give the control away and understand that you're working on their best behalf at all times. Love it. And so that actually, what you just said, segues into another question from Adrian, yeah. um, which goes to the selection of, of brands that you believe are a fit. Um, in a nutshell, um, he re references Shaquille O'Neal, who says that he doesn't just align himself with any old brand. Um, and, and I think there is a question, you know, as an agent, particularly trying to create opportunities for the players, you know, do you have a selection criteria? Does it vary by the player? Does it vary by the circumstances, et cetera? Or, is, or do you really feel like there are certain things that um, brands need to kind of bring forth in order to have a healthy relationship with the athletes? Mm -hmm. um, so I have two categories of athletes. I have athletes that care about money and athletes that care about branding. There are players that legitimately only care if there's compensation attached to it and they do not care what it is and they will do it. So you have to understand that while I try and make everything organic and authentic, that is not always the case. So if you are a certain caliber athlete, you might be able to have that choice where you can do whatever it is if it's got money attached to it. If you're not, um, if you are someone like Alex that is up and coming, the branding component will make you more desirable off the field. Even if you perform well, if no brand knows who you are, it's going to be very hard for them to convince whoever's in the room of their company that you should be the best spokesperson for that brand. So can there I wanna, be- I wanna hold you there though. So when you talk yeah. about personal branding, cause there's another question um, a little further down the chat space about the confluence with, I think it's from Pranav. Um, talking about the, the juxtaposition of this kind of personal branding effort with the culture in the baseball locker room, which is very much a team culture. Um, I'm imagining, this is completely hypothetical, but after this session, Alex is gonna have like 10 million followers, right? Cause you know, I'm the big dude, right? Everybody's, you know, so he's gonna have 10 million followers. Now when he gets to the, the big leagues, the big league club, He's in the locker room folks are like, why does he have 10 million followers? Now the answer is because he, he messed with Jay, but the reality is they may be resentful of the fact that he was invest he, that his brand has been built to a degree and he's only easing into the start of his career. Is that a thing that you're concerned about when you start trying mm -hmm. to help these athletes from the very beginning build their brands? Or do you, are you just like all guns blazing? We're just going to build you as big as we can. Do you know what? I've never, ever gotten that question when I've been asked this before, and I've never thought about that. So um, how do I, how would I put this? So I prefer to get in front of an athlete like Alex, who's relatively new and starting, so we can start early. It's harder for me to rebrand someone that is an acquisition or a client that's older, because they're usually more set in what they've been doing, even if it might not be the best representation of them it's it's a choice so someone like Alex that's starting out I can really help shape his decisions but I also don't want to tell him what to do I will always give him suggestions when it comes to the locker room I don't know I think I think my answer would be my theory in life my theory in life is that there's nothing in the world I can control other than myself and how I perceive the world around me if Alex's teammates want to get jealous five years from now because he's the starting closer, I, I, there's nothing I can do about that. And if he's been smart and conscientious about his brand building from day one, which makes him much more successful in five years, I would answer your question with that person should have had a better agent. Because if their agent is not talking to them about this early, then that's a question about who you chose. And so um, I don't like... I, I would tell Alex not to be arrogant. Like I would tell him to be a good teammate. Like I still think you can have a personal solid brand and still be a good teammate. And so like, I think a great way to look at this is I'll give you an example for another client. We have Aloy Jimenez. So Aloy Jimenez was the rookie for the White Sox last year, had an incredible season. He, he's notorious for the hi mom thing on videos and his nickname's the big baby. So he embraces both of those things 
all the time. If you watch any PR interview he does, he ends up with going, hi, mom. And then he also does everything with big baby, big baby, big baby. He over, he brands himself that way. The brand is really ha like happy and light and airy. So like for him in the locker room, everybody also embraces the big baby brand. And he's like this big giant cuddly bear and it works and no one gets offended by it. Who's to say if somebody will five years from now, but it works for him and he he kind of continues that storyline through everything he does with the high mom and the big baby thing. So, I mean, I don't know. Like, I feel, I mean, again, I feel like you're always gonna have people that are jealous. Are you acting, uh, are you acting in a kind way? And if you are, then you can't worry about someone else getting jealous. That's them and that's, and that's for them to deal with. Alex, does this ever come up in the locker room where people are like, oh, how did you get that such and such? Or, you know, is there is there an awareness even of the stuff that's happening off the field? Um, so, I mean, I, my, my experience only goes up to double A. So like right. at the MLB level with, you know, you have a lot more money that's involved, right? I'm not, I'm, I don't know that half. Here, I'll share a story that literally happened the other day. Um, but like guys, they're always curious about like, oh, how did you, how did you get this deal or how did, you know, or, or do you have a, have a shoe deal or do you have a, a you know, a glove deal or, or stuff like that? Um, you know, and you know, it's not like they're, I don't feel like they're jealous towards me or any, or any way like that. Um, I think that they are curious because obviously, you know, they would like to have that stuff as well. Um, but so the, the other day, I had one of my teammates who's a who um, he was a free agent sign in 2018, and he doesn't he's not represented by anybody, um, and he had seen this uh, my post and everything, and then like sent it to me, and said, "Do you think I should start looking for an agent?" And I asked mm -hmm. him. I said, "Do you feel like you're in the need for an agent?" And he was like, "I'm not too sure because I don't know what they can offer." Like towards me so then I started to kind of lay out you know the the format of kind of what I have, have just explained um a, a little bit ago right. and you know it's kind of opened his eyes um and he asked me he was like oh do you think you can contact your agent for me to see if he would represent me and I said it doesn't I don't want it to work like that I, I said I want you to find someone who fits for you not me telling you hey this guy this is the right one, you know, to do. I know it's a little bit off topic, but the the fact that, you know, some guys just don't really know how to do the branding or do, you know, because for me in 2018, when I first got drafted, I could tell you nothing about how my brand works, you know, but working with Ariel and Mike, it's like, I, I have a pretty decent idea of of how it works and how the process goes to where like, you know, when they approach me with different deals or, or talk to me about things, I'm, I'm on the same page with them usually right from the beginning um, because we, we, we're on the same page. So, yeah, I think it definitely has to do with what type of character that you are in, in the locker room. You know, if you're the guy that gets jealous over, you know, uh, you, you know, that I have brand new cleats coming into my locker, then, it, you know, I think that might be just the, the ego thing. Um, but I haven't really experienced anything like that. Um, but I, I, I may in the future. I'm I'm not too sure. I'd actually, I'd have to. I'd love to ask some of the the veteran guys about that, um, just to see what their their take is on it. Mm -hmm. Jay, I'm going to give you a little company secret. So I am aware that the question you asked me is something that exists. So I'm not going to say that I haven't fully like thought about it. I just haven't thought about it in the way that you phrase that question. Uh, I do do some things where I purposely send items to the locker room because I want that person to open it in front of all their teammates. So we do spring training bags and we get custom made gear, but then I also talk to multiple partners that put headphones and cookies and there you go and like everything in the bag. So when they open it up, they don't just pull out gear, they're pulling out wick away towels or pulling out uh protective gear <laughs> they're pulling out all the things that, 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 that in the bag 
So there you go. Well, Alex, you're like my little like. Um, mm -hmm. Show and tell, baby. He's been away today. I know. So you know, we so on a on a corporate level, there are some strategies to uh, locker room talk. Understood. Yeah. So so I know we're over time already. Sorry. Um, we I talk a lot. No, this is great. I just I'm just trying to be respectful of Alex's time because he's supposed to be out there getting focused on one pitch at a time. But I do want to point out that Alex had uh, recently I, had a birthday. Um, and I would like you to share, if you could, uh, what present you gave to yourself. Here, I have a video of the present Alex gave to himself, guys. So, Alex, why don't you tell us what this is? Let me let, let, me let it pop up on the screen first. Yeah, so yeah. During, during these times, um, it's it's been a little bit tough to go to go out and about. Um, so basically, I had brought the bullpen to my house. Um, so to the to the left, you see we have our solar panels, and then there's about an acre of land. Um, and I was able to just dig up um, just regular dirt, and then there's some clay. Um, put it in my dad's truck, and then move it uh, to this that specific spot right there. Uh, so I built myself a bullpen because I, I couldn't uh, go out, and, and I can't go to any fields right now or any parks because you know, we're, we're supposed to be quarantined. I live in San Diego. So um, I have a buddy who's catching me there. Uh, his name's Chris and he, uh, uh, he's also quarantined. He plays for the, um, the Royals in the minor leagues and stuff. So I know he's not uh, going out and, and doing any, anything or interacting with people. So he's able to come up to the house uh, and catch a, a bullpen. Usually they're uh, mostly on Saturdays. And we just pick one day a week. Um, but it, it's turned out amazing. I love it. It's it's awesome just being able to walk out the back door and and, uh, and throw a bullpen. So I'm gonna play it so you guys can all see how well Alex pitches. <laughs> Is there any other um, questions that anybody had? Well, there are tons. I don't know. I mean, we can go a it's couple fun. minutes over. It's I don't like I'm fine staying. Yeah, so I, I, don't mind, I don't mind it. I've I've got. I already did all of my my uh, baseball training for today. Uh, I'm, okay. I'm good. I'm good for a while. Okay. Okay. So um, first to you, Ariel. Yeah. Um, you mentioned this earlier, but can you talk a little bit more about um, how you source deals? Do you go to the athletes first? Do you go to the brand first? Is there kind of a back and forth? Um, so I don't. I never really go to the athlete to source a deal unless uh, they usually come to me. So so they can come tell me like, hey, I really I really would like this a deal with this person, or this is an interest I have. Can you look into this? So I'll do that. Um, a lot of times it's me just kind of actively pitching people. So especially during COVID-19, I've been trying to be really strategic about digital um, things we can do. So like I had a very long conversation with Call of Duty's eSports League. So not the game, the eSports League division yesterday about doing gambits with our MLB players in their in popular markets. Um, and, you know, that lead up to that conversation made me, you know, I had to give them who I recommended. I had to ask every agent who genuinely plays Call of Duty or Overwatch and get that information. Um, I had to collect all social numbers for every platform from each athlete. And I had to write a blurb as to why that athlete is uh, just worthwhile. So like Call of Duty asked a lot for me before I had this call. So, you know, days of kind of collecting this information and turning it in. Um, so there's a good example about how, you know, I actively went to Call of Duty and was like, you guys have your esports team go leagues going on. Like, how can we do something integrated for, um, uh, you know, for, for these guys? Um, I'll go to other brands too. Like maybe a guy goes, hey, I really want a headphone deal. I'll kind of go to my, my go-tos like JBL and Bose. And if they don't want to work with them, maybe I'll go somewhere else. Um, in the MLB, uh, the MLBPA is a lot more active in marketing deals uh, than I had ever experienced with the M M NBA PA. So a lot of marketing deals for league and or team partners go through the MLBPA and then they push it out to who they think it works for. So 
Um, unfortunately, because of a couple releases not happening yet, I can't talk about it, but like two of my athletes will be like the spokesperson for two different beverage brands in their team markets. So there's, you know, a different relationship. Oh. Yeah. That, that the MLBPA has, like they have two categories where they license out their trademarks, logos, everything to certain brands. And then they have a whole other category for apparel. So like in those deals, um, I think that there are, there are, uh, the promise of some facilitation of athlete based and initiatives. So, you know, again, like this beverage brand came to me and said, you're this particular client that you have in this market is who we want to be the face of our brand for that market. Would you like to agree? So things like that. So they really come from everywhere. Um, I am, um, I'm notorious for screenshotting like Instagram ads and other things I see that are really interesting or like taking pictures of stuff. And then I email the thing to myself. And then Monday morning, I'll go and be like, okay, what are the weird screenshots I sent myself and I'll look at the brands and I'll reach out maybe about those brands or, you know, like Alex comes to me a lot for things he wants and I'd be like, Hey, I really want like this item. Can you reach out to the brand to get this item for me? So, I mean, deals really come from anywhere. I don't think there's any sort of, I don't think there's any recipe for it, but I do think a network um, is really important. So I can call on a really big network that I have if I need anything or if I'm interested or if a client's really interested in something. Um, and again, like keeping those relationships sound means that they're, I'm always top of mind for them. And then they are always top of mind for me if I do need something. Love it. So I'm going to leave the last question to, for, for Alex, um, okay. which is from Tyler Wilson, who's asking, how do you feel about developing relationships with people that support you in media outlets because they believe in you as the player and are relatable, which I think means basically, um, you know, folks who follow you, promote your stuff, et cetera, on social media, it, you know, um, you know, how do you feel about those folks and, and do you ever connect with them and follow them back and so on and so on? Um, I think that is actually a very interesting question because, you know, uh, you're still at the beginning of the journey, but you can see, I'm sure already, that there are some folks who really appreciate you and um, and want to see you succeed. Right. You know, and as, so like in 2018, I didn't really, there was, you know, I have like, I have my group of friends, right? We're called mm -hmm. the hype, right? And that's like our, our group of friends and, and, you know, they they support me with, you know, everything right you know they they got my back no matter what um and you know i always just felt like that was that was super cool you know and then um going into 2019 when more people started to kind of follow and and, and kind of interact it was a little bit different because i had no idea who these people were you know and and then um we were we were in biloxi mississippi in double a and there was a couple people who said that they they had followed me, and um, just being able to talk to them, just I was just uh, you know in the bullpen and stuff. Right. It kind of made me realize that like, you know, these people, this is this is what they live for, you know. So being able to interact with them and, and um, have a conversation, you know, that like that makes their day. It makes my day because I still feel like the Vision Two baseball player that you know is is still just grinding out, you know? So like sometimes for me, like baseball's gone so fast that like I, to, to kind of sit back and enjoy these little things, you know, I, I had mm -hmm. um, someone DM me last night um, on Instagram and they had, they said, Hey, uh, I've been following you and, and I have your baseball card. I'd love for you to sign it, you know? And for me, Oh my gosh, that's super cool that you have my baseball card because for me, I, that's, you know, I, I'm kind of a kid at heart that like, I've always dreamed of having my own, my own baseball card, you know? Um, so, but I told them with like the times that we're in right now, I said that we're not really having anything um, sent to the house uh, just to be as uh, precautious as possible, you know, but I told them, I said, but once this is up, please like DM me again. And I would love to sign it for you. And who knows, maybe, you know, down the road, I could get him like a shirt or something or just like, you know, because I I feel like we can connect just by that little interaction. Um, you know, it makes me feel good to know that like people are supporting me, you know, because I've got friends and family that, you know, I support and stuff. And so it's cool to kind of have that that interaction. And I think social media definitely um, plays a really big part in that. Um, 
you know, and, and it, when it's for the good, obviously it's a, it's a great thing. So. For sure. All right. On that note, talking about for the good, yeah. Alex, Ariel, I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us. Um, I hope for those of you who are out there online that this was helpful to you, informative. Um, but most importantly, you know, one of the things that I hope came across from all three of us is that we really care about what we do. Um, and you can see uh, the passion you hopefully coming off the screen. So um, thank you to my guests. Thank you for all of you who joined us online to be continued. Uh, watch this space. We'll have more sessions like this. But um, guys, as a kickoff, can't thank you enough. Alex, you're, you're the man. Um, I will go out and get myself a Marlins cap as soon as you get the call up. Ariel, thank you. Uh, go Bruins. And go Bruins.